In our review of the film Little Miss Sunshine, we already talked about 15-year-old Dwayne, who sees his dream of becoming an Air Force pilot shattered when he discovers he's colorblind. Next to the highway, he runs down a slope and from the depths of his body, a heartbreaking cry emerges. I don't know whether American theatres actually allow this cry to be heard. Could be that a beep has been placed over it because the word coming out of his body is not very neat. It's an elongated fuck. In the Netflix series History of Swear Words, Nicolas Cage explores how swear words work. To my surprise, I learned there from linguistic scientists that a specific part of the brain is activated when we use swear words. In other words, we are evolutionarily predestined to swear. Using taboo words triggers a number of physical processes. For instance, adrenaline levels rise. And this causes you to gain 5% physical strength by swearing and to tolerate significantly more pain. Before all adolescents now run to their parents with this information to make it clear with all kinds of expletives that there is no point in banning them, they should ask themselves whether precisely this knowledge isn't the reason to maintain the taboo around it. Exactly because they're words that don't belong in our ordinary language, they gain the power that turns them into a survival mechanism. It's a primal cry of powerlessness and pain. I once witnessed such a primal cry personally. The word in question was shit. Short and powerful, it sounded through a living room and it went through the marrow. The scream came from the mouth and intestines of a father whose daughter had been found dead in her home that morning. She'd taken her own life. I can't remember ever seeing such pain as I did that day. Something of that tragic intensity I feel every time I look at Edward Monk's The Scream. The, the Rede Museum in Antwerp is one of 15 places in the world where you can see an original lithograph of this iconic work. The image grabs me. Connoisseurs call The Scream a psychic self-portrait. Edward Monk's life was marked by anxiety, pain and depression. Experiences of loss and death left a deep impression on him, and his art is an attempt to express his tormented soul. Perhaps this is why the Norwegian artist created so many versions of the scream. He produced four paintings and 45 prints of the lithograph. Each version represents a primal cry. Fuck from Dwayne's mouth. Shit in the living room of parents who have found their child dead. However, the connoisseurs tell us there is a misunderstanding about the Expressionist's painting. You think the character in the foreground is screaming, but that's apparently not how Monk himself saw it. It is nature screaming. The person in the foreground perceives the primal scream of creation and shares in the distress. At the same time, the character tries to protect himself from it by holding his hands before his ears. We know that all nature groans and suffers travail, always on, writes the Apostle Paul to the Christians of Rome. In every primal cry, we connect with the pain that transcends us as individuals. In Antwerp Cathedral, there is an ancient gravestone of a gentleman called De Bruyne. The stone in question indicates that he's been widowed 
three times. So much sadness. Deafening sounds the cry of creation when you add up all the pain in it. And yet, the world is not without hope. The profanities we use are ready in our brains to ensure that, despite everything, we stand our ground. The primal cry is a survival mechanism. Because that's what we do. Try to survive with all our might. One of the most famous song lyrics from the oldest part of the Bible depicts this cry. Psalm 130 begins, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Even swear words are ultimately meant to communicate. The cry is made to be heard. That's why it doesn't stop at fuck when Duane expresses his pain in Little Miss Sunshine. When his mother tries to get him to step back in, she uses the argument that they are a family. We're not, he shouts. I don't want to be either. I hate you fucking people. However hurtful, these phrases are necessary to make it possible for the young man to reconnect with his family. This is how much pain I have, he says. And this pain I want to share with you. And when someone has no family, and uh, not even bystanders to scold, then from the depths of misery, you may still cry out to God. Then, in other words, cursing is allowed. The story goes that during World War II, a Jewish group of prisoners in Auschwitz mounted a trial against God. They sued the Almighty for allegedly failing to keep his promises to the people of Israel. After several nightly sessions in one of the barracks, God was found guilty. It became very quiet in the group of Jews when the verdict had sounded. And then the rabbi, who had delivered the verdict, took the floor again. All eyes were on him when he said, Now let's pray. Sometimes in the relationship, it's not about what we communicate, but that the line remains open. And we get no further than shouting. In the 1976 film Network, this becomes a collective cry spurred by the character Howard Beale, a newsreader who discovers that his dismissal is imminent. In a live broadcast, he announces that he will be sacked and indicates that he will commit suicide during his final broadcast. As this subsequently boosts rating, he suddenly falls back into the good graces of his employers. At one point in the film, he addresses the crisis facing the country live. Among other things, he says, I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their jobs. Bill knows that people in these difficult circumstances prefer to be left alone. But he shouts, Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first you've got to get mad. And then he prompts his viewers to get up, get out of their seats, go to the window, stick their heads out and shout, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. And as the journalist keeps repeating this call, you see how the windows of flat blocks open one by one and you hear first individual voices and then the shout of a crowd, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. 
I recognize something of this happening in the Jewish day of mourning, Tisha B'Av. In 2024, this day will take place on the 13th of August. Jews mourn that day for the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem in the 6th century BC by the Babylonians, in the 1st century AD by the Romans. A little paradoxical perhaps, but it is a religious feast for which I somewhat envy our Jewish brothers and sisters. It has an awesome power to organize a collective cry, a cry that has no political color, it doesn't demand solution, doesn't want to push through changes. Sharing grief as a community, no more. In the Old Testament, there is even a book entirely dedicated to this day of mourning, Lamentations, it's called. In a barely lit synagogue, this scroll is recited in its entirety. The texts don't shy away from harsh realities. For example, I read, So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. It's longer than fuck and shit. It's less angry than I'm mad as hell, but it comes from the same abyss of human existence. Except that this age-old lament then opens up explicitly to future. Though a moment ago there was no hope at all, the text continues, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. The primal cry, the scream, the curse, they hurt the ears, but they're there to help us survive. They're indispensable in the great human adventure of standing together in difficult circumstances. And ultimately, they may prove to be the first step in the discovery of a new future, the birth of hope.